this is a little bit of, uh, of an explanation of the, the clinician's perspective of being involved in an FDA study, which was new to me uh, when we started the, uh, the ProDisc study um, at TBI. And you know, the subtext of this is how I grudgingly came to respect uh, the FDA and its principles and learn that this process is a good use of my taxpayer dollars. And hopefully I can share that with you as we uh, start. Um, when, uh, when the old guys here in the room were residents um, in the 1980s, research classically uh, was done by institutions or sometimes by individuals self-funded by them. A lot of time it was just a case series that was done uh, through your chairman's department or um, uh, you know, a, a two guys would collaborate. And that's what was published in JBJS at the time. I mean, that was considered clinical research, um, but it was not really good science. Uh, it was all basically retrospective studies. The endpoints were uh, relatively vague, uh, you know, good, fair, poor, excellent. They were all judged by the surgeons to the patients, so they were biases. But that was what passed for um, and was respected as clinical research, most of it coming out of academic institutions. There was some that was funded by either NIH or uh, government or private grants. So there was some pure research, um, which was a little bit more rigorous, usually required grant proposals, and somebody was, was, was watching about it and monitoring it. Um, and it was stuff, uh, you know, do, uh, diabetics on a high-fat diet have lower blo blood glucose levels. You know, it was things that industry had no stake in, so they weren't involved in it. But it was things that academicians might have a stake in, and that's what, where the government funding came in. Um, but then the question came in in the 1990s. You know, what about these new devices that are being proposed by industry? Should, it, should the government, should our taxpayer dollars be funding them? So I'm going to give you some information that I learned when I co-wrote this paper um, with uh, um, one of the people who'll be speaking in a little while. It happens to be my, my son, who's a reimbursement specialist, and, and he'll introduce himself. But in that, that um, doing the research behind writing that paper, uh, I realized why 1976 was always picked for uh, the date of predicate devices for a 510K. So the medical device, um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed in 1938. And that was when Congress mandated that there would be an agency formed who would monitor uh, the safety of foods, drugs, and cosmetics. But it didn't really say anything about devices. That happened in 1976. That's when the medical device amendments to the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was enacted. And again, it was a mandate from Congress to this organization, to the FDA, to provide for the safety and effectiveness, that's where those two words came in, of medical devices intended for human use. That was the first time that medical devices uh, were specifically put under the purview uh, of that industry. And they do, grouped the devices into three different classes. So class one devices, are kind of general purpose instruments. It's like if you developed a, a, a black scissors or a new needle holder or something like that, you don't have to do an IDE study, you don't have to do a PMA study, you don't have to 510K it, you just have to show that you're using uh, good manufacturing practices uh, when you make it. Class two devices may seek FDA clearance if they can show that they were substantially equivalent to uh, devices that were on the market prior to 1976 when those me the medical device amendment uh, was passed into law. Uh, so those rarely require new supporting human clinical data, although they may need to provide um, uh, appropriate engineering and of course the, the same manufacturing uh, uh, seal of approval. Class three devices were novel technology um, which had no predicate uh, prior to 1976. And they had to prove also that they were going to be safe and effective. Uh, they could not be grandfathered in by a 510K path. Uh, they would require a formal investigational device exemption study, an IDE study, um, and required multiple submissions to the FDA even to be granted the ability to do that. They had to show uh, what's novel, show us the, the engineering data that goes in there, show us some basic mechanical testing, um, some animal testing as we talked about a little earlier, and sometimes even a small pilot study on humans. 
Um, that, that proposal then has to be uh, uh, reviewed by the FDA. There are pre-submission meetings that go on um, where the FDA gives some feedback. The company comes back. The FDA gives a little more feedback and may say, no, you know, go away. You, this, is, this does not meet criteria. Or they'll give some guidance and say, you know, we'd, we'd allow this study if you do this, this, and this, this, this number of patients and, and control it to this, um, this device or not. So the class three device has to be approved before it's being marketed, obviously, by a formal pre-market application, which is kind of the permission slip from the government to be able to commercialize a product. Um, and that's the, the PMA. That's the pre-market uh, approval um, application. So here are the three classes of devices. The class one, as I said, are general purpose um, instruments. Uh, and again, just have to show you're making them appropriately to, to uh, standards. Class two device would be if you came up with a new, uh, uh, you know, hip fracture nail system or, or plate or rod, something that is substantially equivalent to things that have been around uh, before. But then you have novel technology, something that's never been uh, used and, and has no device that you can easily say is substantially equivalent pre-1976. That's what puts you into class three. Um, so uh, our introduction to that really came to with the threaded fusion cages. And that was the first example of a device they couldn't really uh, nail it to a predicate device prior to 1976. And the government said, you guys are going to have to do these studies. Um, but there was also a paradigm shift now in the, the government's thinking where they said, you know, this is a company who's coming to us with their implant that they want to commercialize and make money on. Why should, why should we be paying for it from government um, grants, um, and it's, it, that's not fair to the taxpayers, and you know, they're probably right. So the new paradigm was that the company who is, is looking, seeking commercialization, they would have to sponsor the study. They're paying for it, but it's done under the oversight of the FDA from the beginning to the end, from the very beginning of these initial submissions all the way to finishing the study and then having the FDA go through all the information um, and deciding whether they're going to approve it or not. But, uh, and it, it's got to meet both of those yardsticks, both safety and efficacy. It has to be good. It has to be effective, um, at least as good as, this, as the device that it's controlled to. The control device has to be FDA approved. It could have been a, a you know, 510K approval or a predicate device. But it has to be at least as good as something that's already out there. And um, safety, and safety um, trumping efficacy, actually. Safety is, is paramount. So they get involved, um, again, but the, the government's not paying for that, other than that it's a government agency who's running it. It's the sponsor who's paying for administration of the study, starting with its own internal con uh, employees and or consultants who help put the study uh, together, make the proposals to the FDA, design the study, do the statistics that are necessary to know how many people you have to enroll, um, and then do the nuts and bolts of you know, who's paying for enrollment visits and, and research coordinators and um, uh, monitors and all that stuff. So the FDA monitors the active data collection. Um, they do site visits um, during the course of the exam, uh, during the course of the study. Um, mostly they go to like the, the busier um, re recruiting sites. And, uh, you know, we were blessed uh, a couple of times to, uh, to see the, uh, the FDA come by. Um, and the lesson that I give whenever anybody asks me is um, don't take this lightly. You know, people say, oh, the FDA's. Oh, time out. You know, it's like an IRS audit. These people, they work for the same company as the IRS. They are paid to go through stuff, um, and they are paid to find issues. So you got to make sure your house is in order when you hear the FDA is coming. So the good thing about a scheduled um, uh, IRS, uh, FDA audit is that you know they're coming, and you can, you can spiff stuff up. The bad news is they can also come um, unannounced. They are entitled to do that. And triggers for that are kind of nebulous. You know, it, it could be a phone call they get from, you know, somebody saying, we, we hear something's going on. Um, it could be an article in the New York Times uh, with, with very little substantive uh, uh, evidence behind it. Um, and that kind of happened to us. And they showed up, and they spent a week. And when they spend a week there, um, you got to be with them. You know, they expect the PI at the site to be available to them. I expect the PI at the site to meet with them at the end of every day to go over things. As issues come up, they want all the staff 
you know, focused in. So uh, this is big time stuff. And they'll always find something, just like in the IRS audit. Um, and it's actually a good thing if they find little things they give you, it's called a 483, which is sort of a speeding ticket that um, our announced audit, they, they put a 483 with, with my name on it because although we had selected our patients um, who promised not to get pregnant for three years, which is you know one of the things to do when you enroll in a study like this, um, I did not remind them at every single visit that they shouldn't get pregnant. Um, and they, they, so they, if that's the worst they found, it was okay. But that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that they do. As I said, they're paid to find something. Um, and then uh, as the data gets accumulated and gets close towards the end of the study as enrollments, they start to analyze different modules. They start to look at the engineering modules and, and then start looking at the clinical data um, as it becomes available. And they make the ultimate decision as to whether this is going to be approvable or not. Um, and they can then, uh, even if they approve it, mandate post-market surveillance, um, which uh, it goes beyond the two years of data that they look at, um, has gone from five years to frequently seven years, and even some 10-year post-market surveillance also. So, uh, you know, the big brother is watching us, but I think it's a good thing. And again, safety is really their, their main concern, um, as well as obviously the um, things that, are, that we shouldn't be doing, you know. Uh, um, I have a few slides that were loaned to me by uh, Celeste Bjornsson. Celeste is a, a good friend, and she is director of spine research at uh, HSS in New York. Um, and, you know, she says that when you're designing a clinical trial, you want to define your question and the unmet clinical need. That's what the FDA is going to ask for. Define your primary and secondary outcomes because you'll be held to them as you as your study gets underway. Um, Use standard uh, and validated instruments in the study. And that's what I tell companies who are, want to do an FDA study, and they say, well, how about if we use this um, form? And I said, don't, don't look for trouble. Use the things that they've already used in similar studies and, and don't have a problem with. Don't open up new doors for, for problems would be my advice. But it's, it's important to carefully define the patient population that you're going to put in the study. It may not be the people that you ultimately think the device is best for, but you have to put a box around it. You've got to put you know, barriers and define your patient population um, because patient recruitment is the biggest challenge and poor patient recruitment is the main reason that trials fail. Um, you know, in our ex limited experience with arthroplasty devices, I would tell you that if a study doesn't enroll in 18 to 24 months, it's going to be a real problem. It runs into lots of dollars. It delays time to market for a company who's he already heavily invested. So if enrollments are, are a dragon and, uh, you know, there was one company that was doing a study on, uh, I think, stimulators for odontoid fractures. At the end of a year, year and a half, they had two patients in, <laughs> enrolled, uh, you know, and that they were proposing 300 patients. Well, that's never going to happen. You know, you got to, like, know when to, uh, when to fold them, as the, as the song goes. Um, you have to choose the right sites, and that means choosing the right investigators. So you want to get doctors um, who are busy, who are doing... The, the kind of surgery that you want, but doctors who are respected, hopefully, um, who have uh, you know, research infrastructure that they can work with um, in doing the study um, and have the patient volume. You, know, you can have a wonderful place, but if they enroll two patients for you out of your 300, uh, it's, it's not uh, going to be very, very valuable. On the flip side, you don't want someone who will enroll 100 patients, and usually they'll limit you to 15 or 20 percent of the volume anyway, but you don't want someone who's enrolling, but they're inappropriate patients that are going to cause problems for you later on because they may have deterioration uh, neurologically because they've got adjacent level disease that should have been excluded but slipped through because they were hustling to enroll patients. So, you know, you got to moderate um, your wants with uh, the practicality. Um, interestingly, as Celeste points out, there has to be an upside to the patient also. So, you know, maybe it's a device they can't get um, uh, in the United States unless they enroll in the study. And that's what helped us in the lumbar arthroplasty studies is they'd have to go to Europe um, and there was no way otherwise to get even a, a two out of three chance to get a uh, lumbar disc replacement. And when the cervical studies started the same thing, they had a 50-50 chance of getting a fusion or an artificial disc, but otherwise they would have to go OUS to get it. So that's a good stimulus for patients who have done some reading and are really interested and didn't want fusions at that time. Um, patients may want to do it because it's not covered by their insurance. Uh, it's less financial burden to them, even if it is covered by their insurance. If they get into the study that's designed where the sponsor is paying for everything, 
they don't have to worry about a, uh, their copay. They're you know making uh, or or meeting a deductible. So uh, there may be some financial reason why a patient is interested in doing it. And the last is scientific curiosity. Some patients really do want some new technology because they've read about it or they see it's being done outside the U.S. So there are reasons why patients do it, but there, there's generally there has to be an upside to why a patient is interested in enrolling in a study because it commits them to a lot of follow-up. And, you know, we, we, we really sit down and let the patient know that, listen, you do it through your insurance, you know, do it, we'll follow you for two, three months, and then goodbye, unless you have a problem. Otherwise, you are committed now for coming back for two years for seven visits and maybe annually for five years or 10 years. If that doesn't fit with your lifestyle, please don't enroll in the study because we, what we don't want to do is have people who are dropouts uh, because then you start, then the FDA starts asking, you know, how come so many patients never showed up again? Um, so you need to have good, smart people on the front end to make good statistical modeling so you know how many patients you need. You assume an 85% follow-up um, for your study. Uh, independent reviewers are often utilized for uh, radiology. That's what uh, uh, Tony Viscoli was, was asking the other day about a core lab. Like, what does that mean? It means arm's length. You know, you don't want the surgeons measuring angles for their devices because that introduces bias that is pretty easy for people to accuse us of, even if we're not biased. But it's better to have an independent person doing that measurement and, and doing really as much patient assessment um, as you want. And then you want experienced consultants um, like MICRA, the, the company we talked about yesterday, to help guide you through this regulatory uh, process. It's not for neophytes. It's not for civilians to really go into that uh, battlefield um, without having good consultants. Um, everything has to be passed by a, an IRB, an institutional review board. Uh, big institutions, um, uh, I'm not sure if the Swedish system, I'm sure they do, have their own IRB, but certainly the universities do. But you can also use outside IRBs. But that's a, a group, a committee of usually some clinicians, although probably not a spine surgeon, it would be some doctors, uh, but also administrative people. Uh, clergy are often um, in it, uh, people, you know, community representatives who all kind of look at it from the ethical standpoint. They're looking at it a lot from the patient standpoint. Is this really good for patients and what's the harm and how are you mitigating the harm? So it's good to, to have to have this. So again, this is that comfort level of working within an FDA study that I, um, I talked about earlier this morning about us getting involved um, in this. Data collection is the key to all this stuff. If you, if you are the world's best enroller, you're the best surgeon, you have the best outcomes, but you're crappy in keeping records, if your research staff is losing stuff, uh, losing uh, track of patient visits and they're coming in outside windows, or forget it, you're a loser. You know, your, your site is, you're gonna, the FDA is gonna come in, they're gonna throw out your site data. If they throw out your site data, that may tank a study. And you, if you got a sponsor who's paying tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for a study and that study gets kicked out because their major enrolling site has terrible record keeping and nobody caught that, that doesn't, that's a black eye for everybody who's involved. So um, it's really very, very important. This source information, which now is done electronically and most studies used to be done by hand, and all of that paper source data went to the FDA. So at the end of the study, they got all truckloads, literally, of tractor trailer truckloads of all the source data. And they could, if they wanted, go through that and compare it to the, the statistics you were giving them. And if they, they didn't merge, uh, there was trouble to pay. So um, the fact that they were going to get the original source documents um, kept everybody um, honest. So how does this work in, in real life? The sponsor contacts the FDA, asks them if they can submit a PMA application. There's back and forth pre-submission meetings. Um, as modules, as I said, are submitted at different time points. Sometimes the manufacturing and the engineering modules go in earlier, obviously, than the uh, before the clinical stuff is, is ready. Um, and there are, uh, there's a CRO, a clinical research organization that oversees um, uh, all this, the collection at the site, educates the uh, investigators, educates the clinical research coordinators at every single site. Everybody has to sign off you know, with appropriate forms. Uh, if, after all, we're working under government um, and, and understand uh, you have to take a certain number of hours of um, bioethics if you're dealing with patients. So there's a lot of ancillary things that go into getting involved in the process. Um, as the patients are enrolled, it's the principal investigator at each site who's 
responsible and signs off as being responsible for all the data collection. And even though he, there may be other investigators, and he's certainly not sitting in every room with every patient filling out every page of every form, you have to sign off on them. It's a little sobering um, to do that because when, you know, when it hits the fan, it's the principal investigator who's standing at the side of the desk with the FDA investigator right there pointing stuff out. This is not signed. This is not dated. This doesn't fit with, okay, you know, but it's on you. So um, you have local research uh, coordinators. You have sponsor paid monitors who, when they know there's an FDA audit coming, or even if not, who come in every two months or quarterly to go through everything and say, hey, you guys are missing this. You're missing this to try to keep everything on the up and up. Um, there are the FDA audits. Ultimately, there may be a panel that the FDA convenes to call in to give them some last minute advice. So there are lots of layers of, um, of oversight. So after submission, after the FDA thinks about this, they, they will issue one of three letters, either an approvable letter, which is what the sponsor hopes for, after you know so many years and so many tens or hundreds of millions of dollars um, that this will be approved and you, there may be some conditions that are, are readily met it may be a not approvable letter describing deficiencies saying this is not good um, and probably it's not going to happen but if you do this if you amend your study if you enroll some more patients get some more controls you know they may have some conditions that you can meet but it's certainly not the news that anybody wants or lastly, they can just deny it. They can say, you know, thanks for doing all this stuff, but forget it. And that's sort of what happened to the metal on metal uh, Kineflex cervical and lumbar disc that they were talking about, um, where there were some couple of hiccups, but they were all managed appropriately. The ultimate um, uh, data was really, really good. Metal on metal had just given the FDA a real black eye in the press um, and with their uh, with Congress. So they were not going to get involved in uh, metal on metal at that time. And they stopped those studies basically on the eve of, of their panel. You know, as uh, John Pelosi said with the Maverick and uh, Rick said with the Kineflex. So our best example were, uh, that we lived through because we ran these two side by side was the, the Charité and the ProDisc uh, IDEs um, because they were novel technology. There were no lumbar disc uh, uh, predicate devices. So the FDA required these multi-center prospective randomized control trials. But the good thing is it made us into scientists because we had to identify the patient population, uh, 18 to 60 years old, single level disc disease failed, you know, six months of conservative care, had to have a VAS over this, an ODI over this. Uh, you know, so, so suddenly, okay, we can find those patients, we're treating those patients all the time, eliminate the ones with multi-levels, eliminate you know, the ones who don't meet other criteria. So now the whole deal is find us 300 patients who meet this criteria over the next 18 months or so. They will be externally randomized. Two thirds of them will be randomized to get an artificial disc, one third to get a fusion. And then you fix them and watch them, seven data points over the next two years, and come back and show us the data. That was the, that was the deal. If they're no worse than the fusion controls and everything is safe, we'll give you uh, uh, the permission to commercialize the device. So that was the umbrella that we're working under. Um, but as I said, it finally was good science. It kind of made us into having to, to be good scientists and not just, this is a nice shiny thing I'd like to you know, operate, uh, let me go put it in. Um, so the same data was collected. That's what the beauty of these studies is, it's mandatory. So the same data uh, that I'll show you in the next click, it was collected preoperatively as a baseline and then postoperatively at, at uh, six weeks, three months, six months, a year, 18 months, and then 24 months. And then we follow those patients annually um, out to five years, six years, and, and in one study, even seven years. So collected a boatload of data, but it's always exactly the same standardized stuff, one-on-one -on -one with a clinical research coordinator, signed off for responsibility by the, by the PI. So what is it that we're asking them to do? These the, mostly self-assessment, patient-reported outcome measures, an ODI, SF36, a VAS scale for pain, a VAS scale for satisfaction, of a real, pretty basic physical exam, just motor sensor reflex, straight leg raise. That was the only surgeon input. And this study was designed to eliminate as much surgeon bias, as much uh, operator bias as possible. So that was the only input. Everything else was patient reported. And then the x-rays all went down to medical metrics to be, they were digitized, sent down there, and they did all the digital analysis. So the huge amount contributing towards uh, uh, primary and secondary outcomes were external to the doctors. The, the, the ability of the doctor to influence 
um, the, the outcome in one group or the other was really very, very minimum. And what we did is we made these blinded until postoperatively. The patients, in order to, when they signed into the study, we told them, we will not tell you what device you're getting until you're in the recovery room. And, I, and maybe we lost one patient who said, I can't live like that. But er, every other patient said, that's fine. You know, they had a two, third, two out of three chance of getting a device they couldn't otherwise get. Um, some of the criticism we've gotten, especially from Europe, is they should have been double blinded. You know, how do you do that to people? You know, it's very hard to, you can do it in pharmaceuticals where it's a pill, but you can't really do that when somebody's got, you know, incisions front and back where they see their x-rays hanging up in the office or, you know, they have like a superficial wound infection you got to treat, so you can't do it. But Finding them preoperatively um, was, again, as, as pure uh, science as we could do. So um, every it, so there's there's big data, uh, but and we're used to seeing big data, you know, big charts and all this stuff, but. Big data starts with little data, and the little data is all these case report forms. This was my desk every Friday. I had to see, get all the forms, sign off on the forms that from all the patients that me and the other two investigators were seeing. This is the height of it. Every Friday, they were there. And uh, you know, I, it's my initials. My initials and my date had to go on that because when the FDA came, they were looking through every one of those pages. And if you know you signed over the sticky, and when they pulled the sticky off, there was no signature there, guess who they came looking for? You know, it was me. So it was very sobering that, but I, you know, I gained the appreciation. Big data comes from little data. So these were prospective randomized studies, and from that we developed wonderful science. So this was the uh, the two-year Charité publication, the two-year Prodis publication, um, the two-year Actavel publication, uh, which controlled to both Prodis and Charité. We were good scientists. We were good soldiers. We followed these patients for five years, published the same cohort out to five years at all their centers uh, with the, the Charité, with the Prodis. Um, with the Actavel again, getting a, a glimpse at, at five-year data for uh, uh, Prodisc and Actavel as well. Um, uh, to their credit, um, Esculap committed to six and seven-year um, data points. So we got actual data points at six and seven years on both the Actavel and the Prodisc. At that time, they, we dropped the Charité out because it had been off the market for, for a decade. Um, but here you can see again that fantastic improvement in ODI and VAS from pre-op that we saw immediately post up stayed rock solid now for seven years. So not just five years, but six years and seven years. So, you know, we could not only, we could tell patients, you know, patients said, hey, do you think this is really gonna help? Yeah, I mean, you're right in the middle, you're exactly the patient that would have been in the study. You should get a 50% reduction in your pain, 50% reduction in your ODI, and we can tell you for seven years scientifically that it's gonna stay there. Um, we got even bigger data. We were able to find uh, four studies of multi-center prospective randomized controls. The PRODIS study, the Maverick study that John Peloso was talking about, um, the, uh, the Charité study, and a study from Sweden that was modeled after an FDA study. So all of those four studies had five-year follow-ups. And now you're talking about multiple institutions, lots of surgeons, lots of patients, and the data is poolable because they all use the same criteria. So now you, you throw six or 700 patients from all over the world with five-year follow-up, and you can use sharper statistical tools here. You can use risk ratios um, that you couldn't use on just single center studies to answer a question uh, like, you know, which, in which group are you more likely five years later to have uh, ODI success? In the US, that's a 15-point improvement over Baseline in Europe, it's a 25 point improvement. Guess what? In which group? Statistically significantly, it's the people who randomize to artificial discs. In which group are you better off uh, having low back pain? It, five years in all these hundreds of patients all over the world, it's the artificial disc patients, better than fusion patients. Who's got less device failures? If you asked me in year 2000, I would have said probably the artificial discs are going to fail because they're moving. We don't know anything about them. It's not true. The risk ratio is 0.48. It was one half as likely that the artificial disc patients five years later would need secondary surgeries um, at, at their, uh, their uh, implant level. And then la <clears throat> lastly is patient satisfaction. Is that would a patient be willing, when they think back on it five years later, would they be willing to go have that operation again? Look where they are. It's the artificial disc patients, not fusion patients. The fusion patients did great. Their outcomes were fine. But when you look at this kind of data, it's overwhelming. It's just so much data 
broad and deep um, and, and over time. So, uh, you know, uh, that's enough uh, of, the, of the proselytizing. Um, so just a few, just to, to wrap it up, what are the timeframes for 510K? Some people think, oh, 510K is easy. I just like submit a paper and, uh, and it gets done. It can be a long time. I mean, if you just decide, you know, tonight that you want to do something like that, you know, they're calculating in uh, 32 months, like, you know, uh, about three, three and a half years to kind of get to the point where you start to do some testing and then get your ID and put it in. So three and a half to five years, it could still take you even to get a 510K. What about a PMA study? What if tonight you're sitting at dinner and you start writing on a napkin and you design a better mousetrap uh, to go in the spine? How long is that going to take you? It could take 12 years, you know, several years again to refine all this, to get your team together, to get it organized, to get capitalization. Um, you know, Tony may or may not answer the phone. You know, you may not be able to get there right away. And then you got to, like, design the study, go to the FDA, get the whole thing. And then the study takes, you know, five years to run. It's a long time. Um, and what's the cost? What's the cost of this? If you start from, from the very beginning to that very end, it can be half a billion dollars. If you are just doing IDE, if you've already got the device and you got the idea and stuff, you can do it for you know less. And is this like a, a you know is this a number from the 1990s? No, this is from JAMA, September of 2022. So, a lot of money, a lot of money involved in this. Um, and then keep in mind that more than 50% of clinical trials never reach the market. They they fall out somewhere in the FDA uh, path. Um, that you're, the sponsors are gambling on a market that is five to seven years in the future. So they're putting all this resources and all this time and all this money, and the market may not even be there by the time they get approval, an approvable device. And uh, FDA approval, which in the golden days used to be the signal for insurance companies to cover it, it's FDA approved, Suddenly, that stopped with the artificial disc for some extrinsic reasons that, that Mr. Biscoliosi uh, told us about, some strategic stuff that um, a competitive company did. Suddenly, that's not the case. And here we are still struggling with insurance companies to get approval for these implants that we've been putting in for 20 years, that we've got this unbelievable amount of data that we have for no other device in the body, and they still have a medical policy that renews every year saying, um, you know, we're not uh, paying for it. <laughs> it's still experimental or investigational, so uh, very frustrating. So what are the positive aspects of an FDA study? The multiple layers of supervision. It gives me a lot of comfort, and I gain that you know, by, by kind of living through it, um, that the fact that they get the raw data so that uh, nobody's going to cheat on this. You've got to be an idiot to, to do that. Um, and that there's the potential even if the FDA is not sure, they can convene a, an advisory panel, which in most cases is public. It doesn't have to be, but it often is public so that you can kind of hear the deliberations and, and even have some input. And then the post-market surveillance so that um, even if, if there's a problem after two years, um, there's still the opportunity for that to be uh, caught and uh, reported. So um, the positive aspects of an FDA study is all the monitoring that goes on, the patient safety that is the, the primary concern, big penalties for cheating, um, which include increased monitoring if they think your practices are just sloppy, more serious consequences, especially if there are safety issues uh, to patients. Um, and then career-ending consequences for the PI, which is not a paid position. I mean, if you, people do that because they're passionate about it. And those things can include inability to see federal patients. You, so you can never see uh, uh, Medicare patients for the rest of your career. Um, you could lose your medical license, or you can go to jail with a felony uh, stamp on you if they think that you're cooking the books. Um, the site PI, again, is uh, responsible for this. So, you know, do it if you're passionate about it, but um, do it soberly. And, and, you know, I found it to be scientifically and, and very clinically rewarding because we've been able to bring really good, good uh, help to our patients over these years. We, we talk about that all the time, how many, you know, thousands of patients we've made life better for um, over these years because of the work of, uh, of Tony V and, um, and uh, Dr. Marnay. Um, but it, it's a lot of work and risk. So that's uh, coming back. That's how I've, I've got to grudgingly ad admire uh, the process that we have to suffer through. So thank you very much. I know uh, we're behind time. Allow me one recognition and then one question. So. <clears throat>
first of all, in our state, we have a very centralist controlled thing. Some people call us the People's Republic of, uh, yeah. the Socialist Republic of Washington. And uh, not surprisingly, our state government uh, through a committee want to restrict spine surgery and then specifically disc arthroplasty. And your research made it easy for us to show up there and actually hit back. And it was pretty amazing to hear the chief of that committee, who is an avowed anti-spine surgeon, tell the public, and it's on record, in fact, that the spine surgery community deserves credit for having by far wow. the best research, not just for arthroplasty, but of any medical specialty. And so beyond just the disc arthroplasty, the quality of data for spine interventions and fusion surgery was so high that this really gave us a uh, enormous boost that uh, took the wind out of the sails of this anti-spine surgery. Yeah, that was one of the, the best success stories. So thank you for so bringing that up. Thank you. And the legacy continues on to the present date. Um, the data um, collection and longitudinal efforts, keying on to what I asked uh, Tony before. Uh, so the FDA has kind of changed the rules despite any uh, negative findings on the studies, they've prolonged the observation window longer and longer and longer. Is this the norm now? Can they just change uh, the rules like this? Um, and why not then just start putting the manufacturers together and get a registry going? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this is a great, it's a great question. And they sure they can change the rules. They, you know, they they own the basketball court, so they they put the rules on. Um, but we've tried to use this data to show them that sharp incre uh, decrease in VAS and ODI at really six weeks to three months, and say you should be shortening the the time period and just maintain post market surveillance. Why are you making people do this for two years and three years and four? When you see, you know, we can show you the data that shows that the improvement is dramatic and it's it's very upfront. And so far, they're not willing to do that. Their latest thing is they're saying that they will take real world evidence into account. So um, that hopefully will be a change in uh, the way FDA approves things if they do take data like this. But so far, they have not. 